The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Look with me in chapter 4 of 1 John, continuing our study in this book. We're going to read verses 11 through chapter 5, verse 4. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we Love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Let's pray together. God, thank you for our time together. Thank you for your word how it cuts and wounds and how it heals us, points us to Christ and encourages us. God, thank you for what we just sang, that you hold us fast. Pray that you would do that for us this morning, that you would hold us fast, that you would proclaim the gospel once again to our hearts and encourage us, build us up in Christ by your love, by your spirit, that we then would go and love each other. God, thank you for the power of your spirit to do that in us, and we entrust this time to you now to do just that for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. We dive in midstream here in a series of three arguments that John is making regarding the social implications of the gospel, that we should love each other, that believers should love other believers. These three arguments, beginning in verse 7, are part of a larger context in which John is defining and defending and testing true faith, both to confront false teaching and present a clear doctrinal picture of who Christ is and what it means to follow him, but also preeminently, I would argue, to bless his readers with a settled assurance of faith. Look with me in chapter 1, verse 3. John says, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also. Why? So that you too may have fellowship with us. And what is that fellowship? And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And then a concluding exhortation in chapter 5, verse 13, ties it all together. Verse 13 of chapter 5. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. There is almost an irony to this verse that Christians, believers, would need to be instructed in assurance. But don't we find that to be the reality of our own lives? We who believe need encouragement to know for sure that we have eternal life and to grow in that confidence. I find this this entire process to be so encouraging that God himself, through this letter written by John, would not only tell us of the Christ through whom we are forgiven, but that God would desire that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we possess all all that the gospel promises us in Christ, that we abide in him and he abides in us. This book is about this gospel relationship. 
And our text this morning is full of references to that very relationship with God that you and I have by faith in Christ, that we know Him. In these 15 verses, there's at least 14 references to that relationship. And John emphasizes that we have a relationship with the God of the universe. The Apostle John is uniquely qualified and motivated to bring these truths to us. John not only witnessed the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ, the the economic transaction of redemptive history, that big picture key event of our salvation, he he also walked with Christ for three years as one of his closest friends, if not his closest friend. In that inner circle of Peter and James and John with unique access to Jesus. He was known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Is there a greater title in all the scriptures than that? He was entrusted with the care of the mother of Christ at his death. He knew experientially the love of God, and he wrote this letter for his own joy to be complete, the joy of proclaiming the Christ that loved him to others, that they might know the fullness of it and live in it all their days. This man whom Jesus called the Son of Thunder would grow old in service to Christ, and at the close of the first century, write this letter. With the tender heart of an older man, still full of thunder, but not for God to rain down judgment on his enemies, full of thunder for the the truth of the gospel to reign, and for the love of God to reign in the hearts of all those who believe in Christ. And to that end, John has addressed three main tests in the book of 1 John. And so just a short review. There is a doctrinal test in 1 John. You must believe in the right Jesus, the Son of God come in the flesh. There is a moral test in 1 John, that all who say they know Christ will obey him and walk in the light and not in the darkness. And finally, our context this morning is a social test, an interpersonal reality that believers ought to to and will love each other. He's taken up this emphasis on love two times prior in the epistle. In 2.7 and in 3.11. And then here in 4.7, he makes these three concise arguments defending the obligation of love among believers. Look with me in verse 7 of chapter 4. Beloved, let us love one another. The first argument he gives is in verses 7 and 8, and it centers around the idea that the very nature of God is love. And everyone that is born of God shares in that nature and loves the brethren. The second argument is found in 4, 9, and 10, that the God who is love has made known that love. He's expressed it in the sending of his Son, in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then our context begins in verse 11. We begin the third argument he's making. Not only is the nature of God love, and that love has been made known to us in Christ, but that love is still being made known. It's now being manifested in and through us. His people. Many believe that this section is the pinnacle of this book. One commentator said this, Here the epistle rises to the summit of all revelation. And I agree. I have a two-part outline this morning, and I don't want this to sound like a threat. Our outline is this, Ten motivations for believers to love each other and the assurance that follows. Because the motivations to love are also the motivations to rest assured that God loves us. And then the second part of the, of the outline, which we won't spend too much time on, it's this, five evidences of the new birth, that supernatural reality that then enables us to do what God says to do, to love each other. First, the motivations. John is giving reasons for us to love each other, beginning in verse 11. But those reasons are also deep assurances of our faith. The reasons to love are also the reasons to hope. And to believe and to press on because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by His Spirit. Studying the love of God for these past weeks in anticipation of of my turn in the pulpit, I thought a lot about how desperate we really are to be loved. There's an intense longing and desire in the heart of every person to be loved. Oh, how we love to be loved. How we need to be loved. Consider that desire for a moment. Our soul's utter desperation at times to be loved by friends, by coworkers, by neighbors, by parents, by spouses, by children. 
Think about Adam and Eve and their dismissal from the garden and their shame before their creator. I doubt they missed, first and foremost, the aesthetics and the provision of the garden. Their sin left them separated from God. They were condemned and they were guilty. And the sting was that they lost the glory of the relationship with their maker. They missed God. They missed the love of God walking out of the garden. Our desire for love is in our nature. It is a right desire. But it is certainly perverted by sin. Instead of receiving love, we can desire to be worshipped. Instead of being loved, we can reject love believing that we don't need anyone or anything in this life and become bitter. And that bitterness is just as much a cry for love. Are you bitter this morning? Do you hate the world and everyone in it because it hasn't loved you the way you wanted? John has profound answers for that bitterness. I probably refer to it too often, but I love the children's book, Are You My Mother? Do you remember this? It couldn't be more theologically true. Because the real question of this little bird wandering around asking, are you my mother? What he's really asking is, are you the one that will love me? He's looking for someone like him to love him. And he doesn't find it in a dog or a bus or in the end from a construction crane. He finds it in his mother who is like him. That really is, that is profound biblical truth. I would commend that book to your community group or to your devotions. It's about eight pages long. <laughs> I have two women in my life that often reveal to me personally how desperately I desire to be loved. I speak often with Siri in my truck, <laughs> Apple's artificial intelligence. And then in my office, I talk with Alexa, Amazon's artificial intelligence. And I have conversations with these two personalities. And I actually feel embarrassed and I feel rejected when I mess up the commands to these ladies and I'm trying to give them instructions and they, they have this horrible comeback and it's monotone. I'm sorry, Brian, I can't do that right now. I'm sorry, Brian, I, I don't understand what you're asking. And, and just before I feel hurt and rejected, I have to convince myself, you don't even exist in this world. I will not be hurt by Siri in this life. I've had, the better, I've had the privilege for the better part of my life to work with the 12 to 18-year-old young people in this church and in other churches to watch them in this time of transition into adulthood. It's a time of exploration and discovery, and it's a very exciting time. But it's also a very painful time. And it's agonizing to watch as young people grow up and they, and they cry out for love. And they cry out for love from friends and adults and teachers and the opposite gender. And they're asking, who am I and where do I belong and who will love me? And until that question is answered, there is a frantic searching and an unsettled desperation. It hurts to watch teenagers grow up. But what a joy when one of them is captured by the grace of God, by the love of God, and the search is over. Because these questions are only answered in the gospel. No other answer will satisfy the soul until you are loved by God in Christ. Whether you're 15 years old or 55 years old. Until that is your confession, searching for love will be your painful obsession. So look with me in chapter 4, verse 11. As John unfolds 10 reasons for us to love. Number one is this, we should love each other because God has so loved us. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's a powerful and insightful statement. It sets up all that will follow in our context because it links our ability and our obligation to love to the love of God given to us in the gospel. John here and for the rest of our text in no way brings down the hammer. He in no way says, you better love or else. But he also at the same time in no way lessens or weakens the standard and the obligation of us to love each other. Notice how he sets up this obligation, this duty to love. Three key words in this first verse. The word beloved, the word if, and the word so. There's so much in the first half of this verse that informs the second half. Beloved. 
a term of dear affection, loved ones. Oh, how John loved his audience with great affection. But do not let John become the ultimate issue. I don't think John wants to be the ultimate issue. Beloved, you are so dear to me. Why? Because you are so dear to God. You are so loved by God. The beloved are the ones loved by God. And before I tell you to love, I want you to know you are loved. The little word if. He says, if God has loved us. This is a condition of reality. If God has loved us, and he has. Beloved, since God has loved us, love each other. Before I tell you to love, I want to remind you where you stand. In the love of God. Lest we ever strive to love to gain that love. From God. The third word, so, this little word is translated thus in some translations. It tells us in what manner God has loved us, to what degree. If you glance back at verses 10 and 11, he tells us in what manner. In this is love. Not that we loved God, take us out of the equation. In this is love, that he loved us and sent his son. He loved us unto death. He loved us by great sacrifice, through much pain. Beloved, since God thus loved us to the degree that he would send his beloved son who deserved nothing but the father's love and glory but received God's eternal wrath and punishment so that you and I could have life. If he has loved us thus, how can we do anything less? How can we do anything less but join him in this love? There is no higher motivation. The love of God is transformative. In this passage, it's not a piece of art to be appreciated. It's not static. It's not boring, uninspiring. The love of God is powerful and life changing. The law crushes us, condemns us, and then the love of Christ comes and lifts us up and fills us and washes over us and changes us into those that love each other. Do you love perfectly? Neither do I. But do you believe the love of God for you in Christ? It's a better question. If you do, then let us love one another. You see both the motivation and the assurance in this text. God wants me first to believe his love for me before I set sail to love others. But we must and we will set sail in that love. Second motivation for us to love each other is this. Number two, when we love each other, we see God. 1 John 4, 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. In John 4, 24, the apostle John says that God is spirit. He is immaterial. The first and third persons of the Trinity are spirit, and you cannot see them with your eyes. And so every Old Testament physical appearance of God was either a theophany, in which God appeared as a burning bush or a pillar of fire in the sky, or a Christophany a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, visible with form. John's argument here is that though no one has ever seen God, we actually can see God. His nature expressed through his people when we love each other. He says, if we love each other, God abides in us. And in this context, this word means remain. It means stay, reside there. It's John's way of saying you're a Christian. You abide in God and God abides in you. And when you love, we see the evidence of that. His nature is in you, and in that sense, we see God through you. There's similar language in John 1.18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. No one has seen God, but Jesus has come and manifested him to the world. He has shown us God. But now Jesus has ascended to the right hand of the Father, but it is not as if God has disappeared. He's still visible. He's still making himself known in the world. How? In the day-to-day, big and small, thoughts, words, and actions of our love. It puts our love into an entirely different context. When you walk into work, when you speak with your siblings, Kids, when you interact with your parents, you and I can show each other the very nature of God himself, or we can show them something else. We can show them something less. Sunday mornings in my family historically have been a very chaotic time. 
lots of kids, the rush to get out the door, to get to Sunday school. But there's something about leaving church that's very different. And it's a bit mysterious. And this, this passage really clarified for me what it is. When I leave church, I feel full and encouraged and loved. Why? Because when believers get together and we love each other, we see God. We see God in and through each other. We experience the love of God. He showed himself in Christ, and now he is showing himself through us. That is an incredible privilege and responsibility and a great motivation to love. God says, show me to others. Represent me. Be an ambassador of my nature, my love. Is that you? Are you portraying to those around you all the time for everyone the very nature of God, the very love of God? Or do some people get the nature of God and others get a different nature? There can be a duplicity in our lives, a hypocrisy. When some get love and others don't, God help us to only ever manifest that one nature of his nature of love. Number three, when we love each other, God's love is fulfilled in us. The end of verse 12, and his love is perfected in us. The word for perfected means to be finished, to be completed, to be accomplished. It does not mean that we love perfectly. That will not happen in this life. It does mean that the purpose for which God loved us has been accomplished. His love came for us and it got us. It is made perfect. It's fulfilled when we are saved and we are loving. It's two sides of the same coin there. And so what an encouragement for us that when we love each other, it's like God says, there it is. It's, a, it's been accomplished. That's why I sought you and that's why I bought you. That's why I loved you so that you would go and love others. My love is fulfilled in you. When we love, we experience that completion. This is the fulfillment of his love in me. I see God at work in me. He's doing it. And it should bolster our hope and our confidence in the gospel. And it should motivate us to love. What about when I don't love? What about when I fail to love? Then the love of God brings us to repentance. And we confess our lack of love and we are forgiven. And our strength is renewed to love again. That's also the fulfillment of his love. Think back to 1 John 1, 9. One of the tests is that you and I, as true believers, are confessors. We're repenters. We have a new direction of love and repentance towards Christ, even when we fail to love perfectly. When we love, God's love is fulfilled in us. Fourthly, when we love each other, we see the Spirit's work. Look in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. The by this in verse 13 is instrumental. It refers both back to the if we love of verse 12 and to the work of his spirit in the end of, of verse 13. By this we know that we are his and he is working in us. No one loves apart from the spirit of God. And every believer indwelt by the spirit of God will love. And so when we love, we testify that he has given us of his spirit. And the Spirit is working, and the fruit of which is love. Ephesians 5, 22. 1 John 3, 24. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. There's both an inward testimony of the Spirit, Romans 8, 16, and an outward demonstration of that testimony that echoes forth in our actions. In our context here, 4, 13. Listen to Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. That inward testimony. God has given us his spirit. One of the, one of the roles of the, of the Holy Spirit is to speak to our soul. Not audibly, but definitively. In our spirit to tell us and remind us that we, in fact, are his. And through his spirit, then, Chapter 8 goes on, we cry out, Abba, Father. We respond to that inner testimony. You're my dad. He's given us the third person of the Trinity as a resident and very vocal confirmation to preach his love directly into our souls. You're mine, you're loved, you're my child. It's like an IV right into the vein. 
It's like a port right into the heart of your soul that God loves you in Christ. It should make us want to walk by the Spirit and listen to what He's saying to us as the Spirit tells us of His great love for us. To love is to see the Spirit's testimony at work. And to see the Spirit's work is to have assurance that we are His. And that motivates us then to go and love each other. Fifthly, when we love each other, we own the gospel and its effect for ourselves. Look in verses 14 to 16. 14 to 16 is sort of like a gospel interlude. It's sort of a corporate confession of of what the gospel is and what it does in us. We have seen, uh, verse 14, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. The we in verse 14 is somewhat debated. Is John referring to the apostolic witness of those that actually saw Jesus during his time on earth? Or is he referring to all those who have seen him now by faith? I think the context makes me think it's both. There's an inclusive we here, which then invites you and I into this text. All believers agree to these things. This is our confession corporately, but it's also mine individually. We have seen that the Father sent the Son to save us. We testify to that reality. We confess Jesus as the Son of God. And that corporate confession, though, it has very personal implications. To agree with John here, to join the we of this confession, you must by yourself, alone, trust in the Lord Jesus. You must own the gospel for yourself. No one is saved by affiliation with a corporate confession, but by individual faith in Jesus that joins others in that confession. The result of that testimony here is that I'm saved. God abides in me by His Spirit, and I abide in Him. I live in God. We live in God by faith in Christ. But that is not the end of His confession. And so look in verse 16. The result of the confession of Christ is not a distant mutual abiding. There's just peace between me and God, and then we went our separate ways. But the text goes on to identify our relational status before God. John says we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. And I want to pause and consider that love. Do you know that love? Christian, have you come to know and do you believe that God loves you? Not that he loves the church, not that he loves us, but that he loves you. Not just that God puts up with you, that he endures you like some annoying little kid at school. Not that he deals with you from a distance, that you may well be in the kingdom, but you're barely in the kingdom and he's got his eye on you. Some believers live as if they are perpetually on gospel probation. Just one bad decision away from getting thrown out of the kingdom and losing that that favored status of child of God, rather than by faith believing what God himself testifies about you, that he really does love you, that he has an undying, unstoppable, fatherly, forgiving, welcoming, soul-satisfying, eternal perfect, divine, and holy love for you in Christ that has nothing to do with your performance and never will. The exact same love that he has for his son Jesus. No one questions whether the father loves the son, but we wrestle with his love for us in Christ. But it's the exact same love. Dare we believe that? Dare we believe that that is true? I think the better question is, how dare we not believe that? How dare we stare at the cross and question his love? How dare we live like God does not love us to the degree and with the certainty that he says he does? He's not lying to us. The gospel is not a cosmic joke on believers. He's simply telling us the truth and we should believe it. 
It's hard to live in love when you're not sure if you're loved. Why is it so hard to believe the love of God? It's because every single one of us, every day, we are confronted with our failures to be everything we want to be for the glory of His name. Because in reality, we are so unlovely in our sin. Because the sin that we will commit today renders us worthy of everything but His love. And yet the gospel says definitively, continually, otherwise. And so God in His mercy has built into our gospel experience abundant and sufficient reminders and confessions of that love so that we will believe it and live in it and respond to it. Think of just a few. The Word of God. This entire book like our text this morning, like this verse in front of us, like page after page of redemptive history culminating in the person of Jesus Christ that affirm his love for us and the security of it. Think about the Lord's table. He says to come to it often. And as much as it is a confession of our heinous sin and rebellion and the infinitely high cost of our redemption. It is also nothing less than his confession of his love for each one of us in Christ. Think about the spirit we just read about. He has given us of himself to testify to our, our very soul that he loves us and we are his children. I am overwhelmed Not just with the love of God, but his desire for us to be convinced of the love of God. I think it's best expressed in Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3. It requires supernatural empowerment to believe not just that we are loved, but the infinitely large dimensions of that love. In Ephesians 3.17, Paul prays, he prays that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints What is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God? Do not be afraid of that prayer and stop undermining it by staring endlessly at your sin instead of at the cross. When we love, we testify that this gospel is mine and its effect is mine And that becomes an incredible motivation and an incredible assurance that God loves us in Christ. Number six, when we love each other, we live confidently before God. Verse 17, by this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. If you don't know Christ this morning, you have no basis whatsoever for confidence before a holy God. The Bible says you are his enemy, and he promises judgment upon you, and your sin is really that bad. And you should fear him, and you should believe the gospel and come and receive his love. But for the Christian who knows God and loves, verse 17 says, by this, when we live in love, love is perfected in us. And the effect of that love is confidence looking forward to judgment. And if I have confidence that that greatest threat, the greatest enemy now loves me, that I'm forgiven, now I will have a strange confidence in this life like no one else. Only believers can have this confidence to live in love before the God of the universe and portray that love to each other. You and I need confidence in the Christian life. Not in our own strength or our ability. We need confidence in the gospel that sets us free to love. John is commending that we believe our identity. Look at that little phrase. As he is, so also are we in this world. That's an incredible statement for us to believe by faith. Because how is Christ? He's perfect, he's loved. He's victorious, he's confident before his father, and John is saying, that's you. Listen, it's not pride, but faith to live that way. And we ought to live that way. And John is commending and commanding that we live that way. Number seven, when we love each other, we won't live in fear. Verse 18 goes on, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. 
because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. The opposite of confidence is fear. John is saying here that they are mutually exclusive, that if, if you had a space that was full of fear and you filled it with love, the love would push out all that fear. You are that space. They're mutually exclusive because I cannot at the same time draw near to God believing his love and run away from him fearing his judgment. Are you still afraid of God? His wrath, his eternal judgment. And if you are and you are a professing Christian, then the question is why? Why are you afraid of this God? The very nature of the gospel is to end that fear once and for all. We can all be tempted at times to be afraid of God, but it's a temptation that is perpetually answered every time in the gospel. That there's no condemnation for you. There's only love. There's only the affirmation of you as his child. And so this fear then is a lack of faith. It is the very evidence of salvation for fear of judgment to be gone. My judge has become my father, my enemy, my friend, and I am reconciled to God. And when we love, we bear witness to his abiding in us. And we live in the confidence of his favor and not the fear of his judgment. Listen, God does not want you to be afraid of him if you are in Christ. Number eight, when we love each other, we magnify the first cause of our love. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. All Christian love is responsive. It is enabled by God to be reflected to each other, and we, we must not forget its source. That's why it is an impossibility to tell someone outside the kingdom of God who doesn't know Christ to love. You must be born again to love, to truly love in a way that pleases God. And everyone that God has loved will love, because our love is a supernatural it's a response to his supernatural love for us. It's guaranteed. His love incites us to love and it provokes us and inspires us. Believers love and when we do, God is magnified as the cause and the source of that love and he gets the glory. Number nine, when we love each other, we avoid a catastrophic lie. <clears throat> Look at verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. John's goal here is not harsh name-calling. He's not just out to find someone and call them a liar. The point is to identify the lie and avoid it at all costs. <clears throat> there is an impossible hypothetical in this text in which a person claims love for God and at the same time practices hatred for his brother. 1 John 2.9 answered this earlier in 1 John. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. He's not a Christian. You and I want to avoid this lie at all costs, and through Christ we will and we have. It is a lie that reveals a deception that unfolds a reality of unbelief with eternal consequences. John argues from the easier to the more difficult. If you can't love a person right there in front of you, easier... How can you say you love the unseen God? More difficult. If you can't love the image bearer, how can you say you love the image giver? And the answer is, you cannot. The remedy and the protection is to believe the gospel and to repent and to turn to Christ. And then having been loved by God in Christ, you will be free to live in the truth. And that means loving both God and your brother. When we love each other, we avoid this lie. Ten, number 10, tenthly. When we love each other, we confess God as God, 1 John 4, 21. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. <clears throat> there is essentially nothing in this verse that John hasn't already said. Love God, love your brother. Except this first phrase puts an emphasis on the origin of the, of the command. He says this commandment, it's, it's from him. It's from God. And he, as God, has every right and every authority to rule his universe and instruct his creation according to his nature. In Romans 10, Paul says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that one word, Lord, is so important in that confession. The confession is not lip service. It is life submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to acknowledge that I am not in charge anymore. 
We come to Christ on bended knee, or we don't come. Luke 14, 26, is, it's an interesting chapter because Jesus is really pushing back against people. If you won't come according to the truth of the gospel, you can't come at all. He says in verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. If you will not die and repent and the end of you, Jesus says you can't come. Because that's not the gospel. To follow Christ is the death of self. Lordship is not optional. It's not occasional. It's foundational. Faith in Christ is, is to entrust not only my eternity to his work on the cross, but to submit every moment of my life and my emotions and my decisions and my affections to him. This commandment, John says, is from him. God says, love your brother. Our resistance to loving our brother, and there will be many in this life. My hurt or my offense will never outweigh his authority to command my heart, to instruct my love. And it will never outweigh the power of his spirit to bring about that love in my heart. Briefly then, just because I must finish every text that was given to me, I want to look at five evidences of the new birth, which will be incredibly fast. This is sermon number two, and I'll do it in four minutes or less, guaranteed. But it is answering the question, how then do I love like this? How do I go out into the church and into the world and love with the very nature of God? And the answer is, you must be born again. You must be changed on the inside. The beauty of the gospel is that his great love makes it our joy to obey him. And in these first four verses, he gives us five evidences of the new birth that empower that obedience. To be born again means that God in his mercy, as the first cause in our salvation, by his spirit, overcomes our sin and blindness and gives us a new heart. And we are spiritually reborn. And then, and only then, born of God, we respond to the gospel in faith so that God alone gets the glory. The first evidence of the new birth is there in verse 1. We believe that Jesus is the Christ. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And the question is, and this, this verse answers it, is do we believe to get born again or are we born again to believe? And the text tells us definitively that the one who is presently believing in Christ is the one who has been perfect, passive, indicative, has been born of God and enabled by his grace to believe. That should cause us to be thankful for our salvation and not own it like something that we move the God of the universe to us. Come and make me born again. He did it of his own will and of his own mercy. The second evidence of being born again is that we love God. That's the assumed reality of having your heart changed. That the one who's done it and given you life, we love. The third evidence is that we love other believers. He goes on, and whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. John makes a really interesting argument here. It's an appeal to consistency. To love the father and hate the child is inconceivable within the gospel because we share a family identity as the body of Christ, a familial nature and love with both the father and his children, meaning we don't get to pick family members. I love the dad but hate my siblings. The new birth brings about a full family love in Christ. It is the very evidence of it. And then fourthly, the fourth evidence of the new birth is we freely obey God's commandments. Verse 3, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. The Pharisees made it an art form to take God's commandments and make them heavy upon people, burden people with them. Jesus explains that in Matthew 23. But it, it, well, I'll read it. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. That is not the gospel relationship that we have in Christ. Because Jesus was willing to move the burden of our obedience through his life and through his death. He says, come to me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so why are God's commandments now not a burden to us? Why is it the very evidence of the new birth that obeying God is not a heavy, torturous event? Briefly, because the penalty for God, the penalty for not obeying God has been removed at the cross. Because the righteousness of Christ that gains my acceptance with God is already mine by faith. 
And thirdly, because now we love our Savior, and when you love the object of your affection, obeying that person is a joy and not a torturous, heavy burden. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And we answer back in the gospel, we do love you. Thank you. And we love to obey you in every way. And then fifthly, the final <clears throat> evidence in our context of the new birth is that we overcome. And that's how we'll finish. 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. There's a play on words that we don't get in the English. The Greek word for victory is nikao, where we get Nike. I'll just use Nike and read it. For whatever is born of God, Nike's the world. And this is the Nike that is Nike the world, our faith. Who can love like God? Who can resist the onslaught of temptation in this world? This is the place that we need to finish in this context because faith is the victory, not the strength of our faith, but the object of our faith. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who overcame, ensures that every single one of us in Christ will overcome. And so you and I conclude this context believing, I hope, encouraged, I hope, that we simply cannot lose in this life. Every trial, every temptation, every crushing disappointment, every persecution, and every loss, faith will overcome. And through faith, God will bring us safely home. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your great love for us in Christ and the abundant and sufficient and compelling motivation for us to go now and love each other. God, we pray and ask that you would do that in our hearts, you would do that in our church, that we would excel still more in this, this blessed reflection of your nature. God, help us to show each other your very nature of love. And God, thank you that you have empowered us to do that through the new birth, that you have sent your spirit and you have opened our eyes and you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear and you have changed us into your children. And now you're working to make your children like yourself. God, we thank you for that process and we give you the glory for all of you. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.